The first question I want to ask you all today is, why did you attend school? What role do you believe that school has in society? Well, this guy named Albert Einstein had a different idea of what education really means. He said this, education is not the learning of facts, but the training of the mind to think. Similarly, I have a different idea of what the role of school in society really is. I believe that school has a responsibility to cultivate critical thinkers. So what does being a critical thinker mean? This term is one that a lot of us are familiar with, especially you as teachers. To most of us, the word critical might have a bit of a negative connotation, but the truth is that critical thinking is a positive thing. The term can be defined in many ways, but to sum it up, critical thinking is the ability to logically break down an issue, recognize biases, including your own, and evaluate the information given in order to come to a conclusion. Critical thinking can be challenging, especially in a world that is pulling us a million different directions. As a teen, it can be very difficult to navigate our dynamic and complex world. Knowing what to believe is not easy. But I think that as a young person and as young people who are constantly cultivating our own identities, we need to use critical thinking as a helpful tool. So how do we become critical thinkers? Well, it doesn't happen automatically. This is where you and our schools can come in. As our world appears more polarized and divided as ever, it has become evident that we have become scared to have conversations that make us uncomfortable. We shy away from vital conversations about gun violence, climate change, abortion, women's rights, all of these other issues that have been labeled as controversial. Although adults and teachers in my life and many other teens' lives might think that they are protecting students from these issues, the truth is the more that we stray away from these issues, the more miscued and misunderstood they become. We need to face these issues head on, face the realities of the world around us and therefore equip students with tools to navigate them. Students' voices matter. And we've seen how students' voices can be effective all around the world. We've seen the power of young advocates like Malala and Greta Thunberg, all the way to inspiring poets like Amanda Gorman and the impact that they have had. These advocates don't only inspire us, but they prove that young people, when given the power and when have learned to use their voice, can be truly effective. So how do we cultivate these change makers? Well, I believe that conversation can be a vital stepping stone in cultivating these change makers. Now, the reality for my generation and many generations to come is that our lives will exist both online and in person. Our growing online presence can create false realities for us as teens. What our lives should look like, what others look like, what the world really looks like. How much time do you spend on social media per day? Well, the average US teen spends 4.8, almost five hours per day on social media. How do we believe that this time spent online doesn't create illusions for us of what the world really looks like. In most social media apps, the user is likely to spend their time in their feed or for you page. This is a page that is crafted specifically for the user by a complex algorithm that collects all of the user's data and then generates content to appease to that user. Our social media will give us content that we want but is it content that we truly need? Each of our individual feeds looks vastly different from one another, 
but sometimes it's hard to understand that our individual small sides of the internet is not what the rest of the world looks like. This is what creates that illusion and false reality for us as young people. As young people, we're constantly told to be open-minded, but almost all of the information that we consume is curated. It's not only curated, but it's cu curated specifically for us to appease to us. To broaden our horizons, we would need to go out of our way to expose ourselves to new perspectives and ideas. This is both challenging and inconvenient. And let's face it, you know it, most teens won't do that. Once again, this is where our schools can come in. Now, how do you teach open-mindedness and critical thinking? Well, we all know that it can't really be taught through a textbook. We need schools to be a place that broadens our horizons, teaches us on relevant and global matters, and exposes us to new perspectives. All of these things sound wonderful and catchy, but perhaps impractical. So how do we teach it? I believe that what really can create change is conversation. It seems simple, but I've seen it be transformative before. To have students not only learn how to talk to each other, but actively listen to each other, how to reflect and how to shape their own view, views, gives students the tools that they need to thrive in life outside of school. Who do we want our students to be after they leave high school? Do we want them to be people that can go into a workplace or a community or a place of religion and then be able to lead difficult conversations? I think we do. In school, we've learned how to debate. And this idea of debate versus dialogue is one that came up as I was thinking on this topic of difficult conversations. We've learned how to debate, how to go back and forth with winners and losers, with arguments and with rebuttals. But isn't it more important to teach dialogue? Conversations where winners and losers don't exist, where mutual respect is the goal, and through mutual respect, hopefully mutual understanding. I think that these are the conversations that really will stick with us as students after we leave school. So why do I believe that we need to introduce these conversations now? Looking around at our world today, it may seem depressing and hopeless. The issues that all of us face, but especially teenagers, can become overwhelming without any space to discuss them. Many teens see headlines of disasters every single day but don't go any further. Or they're on the opposite end of that spectrum and are incredibly passionate about a subject, but have no space to dive deeper into their understanding and talk about it with their peers. So I want to emphasize as well that I believe that educators and adults in my life and teens' lives want to help us navigate these issues, but either they don't know how, they don't feel equipped or educated, they're afraid to, or simply, they aren't allowed to. Now, this term is one that a lot of us have heard before, and it was something that also came up as I was diving deeper into this idea of difficult conversations. Let me define it real quick. Cancel culture um, is defined by Oxford as a social environment in which publicly boycotting or withdrawing support for people and organizations regarded as promoting socially unacceptable beliefs is a widespread practice. Now you might only know cancel culture from a celebrity being shunned or canceled, or you've seen it in mainstream media and Hollywood. But the truth is that the effect of cancel culture, the fear that it has created, has trickled down through society into our smaller communities and even into dinner conversations at home, at the table. Now, I want to acknowledge that cancel culture, yes, can be very damaging, but I want to say that the intent of justice behind a lot of these cancel cancellations are, are real and also valid. So 
cancel culture isn't black and white, but the fear that it has created in our society is prevalent. And we can see how our fear to have these difficult conversations is affecting us. Now a little bit about my experience. As a kid, I grew up um, and spent most of my teenage years in the suburbs of Washington, DC. And I was a middle schooler during the 2020 election. Many of the adults in my life didn't believe that the social or political state of the country affected me or my peers. But the truth was that the conflicts that were going on affected us tremendously. I saw kids in my school who were faced with racism and discrimination every day. I saw kids who were being judged for their political beliefs or standings. And I knew kids who had all of a sudden become faces for social movements that either they wanted to represent or had no idea what they were. What we needed at that time was to have these difficult conversations. But that time in my life was also the first time that I realized that we as kids had become so scared to say something wrong that we didn't even ask questions. When we did have conversations just as peers, emotion and misinformation often got in the way of any true understanding. What I needed and what so many of my peers needed as well was to be able to have these difficult conversations but have ones that were facilitated and guided by people we trusted, our teachers. Our fear of discussing difficult topics, our fatigue of the constant polarization that we face in our everyday life can become dangerous. How? Well, we stop talking. When we stop talking, we stop learning. And isn't school a place for us to learn? Thank you.